So, speed up the monolith, building a smart reverse proxy in Go. So, my name is Alessio Hayatza. I work as a backend engineer at GitLab in the infrastructure department. In the footnotes, my Twitter handle and my email. And I'm really glad to be here today because this conference has a special place in my heart. When I started learning Go, it was at the first GoLab conference. And I was sitting there just listening to talks, and now I'm here presenting some of the things I've done. So I'm really happy to be here. So imagine that you're working on your own deliverables, like an engineer department, and the infrastructure department announced that we are going to migrate the production environment from Azure Cloud to Google Cloud Platform. So, wow, it's a big change. More or less at the same time, the distribution team announced that we are going to release a cloud-native version of our application, more or less in the, same, in the same time span. Wow, this is really good. But then you go back to your work and start thinking about all the little technical depths, all the tricks that are in the code, and this journey starts looking like something like this. Say, so, oh, well. But before we start with this story, I need to go back in time around mid-2015. So, we are a Ruby on Rails shop. Why I'm here talking about Golang? Well, we had a problem that we had to solve. We had this big monolith written in Ruby on Rails, and we started facing problem with slow requests. Nobody likes slow requests. They have, they are troublesome, but imagine doing Git operation over HTTPS. It's a slow request, definitely. And we had no solution for that except then clone over HTTPS. Sorry, clone over SSH. So mm, not really a solution. The reason why this was a problem for us is because our uh, application server was Unicorn, which was designed to serve only fast clients. This is a forking daemon. So you have a master process. It spin ups. Then it forks, creates new workers. And those workers are handling one connection at a time. So if a git clone comes in and you have your monolith, this means that your Ruby on Rails code is going to handle the git clone operation with one worker that is just serving only that clone operation. So requests may start piling up if you have many developers that are just cloning stuff. OK, so enough Ruby. Let's take this as a general reference architecture for today. So we can imagine that we have a uh, load balancer in front of everything. Then we have a web server, in our case, Unicorn. We can imagine that we want to do some asynchronous processing. So we have a queue processor and a Redis instance for handling the queue. So keep this in mind for the rest of the talk, because it's what we are going to talk about. So what we did? We decided to create workers, which was a uh, the name was for making fun of the mythological unicorn, because if you want to do some heavy lifting, you need the workers. And the idea is that you can build a smart reverse proxy. The reason why you want this to be smart is because there are a lot of reverse proxy out there, but you want someone that, something that can understand your payload and only act where it's needed. So the first question is, how hard is writing a reverse proxy in Go? Three lines of code plus error checking and imports. So not that difficult. Let's go through it. First thing you need is a URL. So your upstream server, you need the URL for the upstream server. Then with the URL, you can create a new single host reverse proxy, which is provided by the standard package in the HTTP utils. OK. And then you'll listen and serve. Done. Everything that goes to port 8080 will be forwarded to your upstream proxy. This is a working single host proxy in Go. So it's easy, OK? But this, this is not slowing up, uh, slowing up, speeding up anything. So how can we speed up a slow request? We can imagine that we have a backend operation that has a slow endpoint at slash slow. Yeah, fantasy name. So this is the code we need to write. It's a bit more. I removed the imports, but it still fits in one slide. So. Let's go through it. First thing, oh, yeah, you can read it, yeah. First thing, we need a router from the, for instance, we can use the Gorilla Max uh, package. 
The reason why we need a router is because we want to understand what is coming in and act only on selected uh, endpoint. In our case, the slash slow endpoint. Then you need a middleware for handling um, headers. This is important because, uh, because you are putting a reverse proxy in between, and all of a sudden, all your logging information in the upstream server will only have the IP address of your proxy. So that's not helpful at all. So this is just adding some X forward either so that the upstream server can know the IP address of the incoming connection. So that's it. Then this is the, the part which you are interested in too. You can write a handle function that intercept your slow endpoint and rewrite this in Go. Well, this is a simple example, but the idea is that you can rewrite this. And then you go back to the old example. You still build your single host reverse proxy, and you, everything else will be handled by this. So what we have here is the same proxy as before, but if we request slash slow, it will be handled directly in Go. Otherwise, it will go through the old upstream server. So as I said, we had problem with cloning operation in Go, and we ended up with this diagram. We replace the server with workers. We put the, our upstream server behind it. And at the very first iteration, so 22nd September 2015, the Git operation was handled something like in a CGI way. So we were just shelling out the Git process from the proxy and forwarding this, the body to it. So this was the first iteration. Over time, we built uh, Gitaly, which is what is the Git storage there, and it's a gRPC process. And yeah, you know, you start building Go, and then more Go, more Go, more Go. So this is what we have. So the slow request was no longer a problem. Two months later, November 2015, we released CI. So we had another problem with slow request. Uh, with a CI, you can imagine that you have to upload artifacts at the end of your build. And this can be a big package. It can be up to one gigabyte, two gigabytes. It depends on the limit. So this is a slow operation by definition. And the reason why this was a problem with a Ruby on Ra standard Ruby on Rails application is that with a Ruby on Rails application, you have a middleware that intercept the, all the multi-part requests, dumps the content of the file on disk, and then replace this in the hash of parameters. So that when the code reaches your controller, you just have a hash of parameters, and there's a file there, which is ready for reading or do what you want. Now, the problem is that in our production environment, uh, a Unicode's process is around 800 megabytes of RAM, while a worker's process is 70 megabytes. So you can imagine where you want to spend your time. Also, if you consider that uh, the workers has go routines, so it can handle more connection with the same 70 megabytes of RAM, while Unicorn is just a forking daemon, so it can serve only one connection at a time for each worker, OK, you really want to move this operation up to the, to the reverse proxy written in Go. So we simply moved the dumping operation in the, in the proxy. So the idea is that you have a client that is doing some post operation with a, a multi-part file. You can scan it at the worker's level, so in your proxy, and dump it to a temporary location. Then the, the reason why we call this body hijacking, we hijack the body of the request and remove it, and we forward the request with some metadata added to it to the upstream implementation. So What's happening in Rails is that the, um, the middleware that deal with file dumping is no longer triggered because there's no multi-part upload. But you can write a simpler middleware that intercept the headers and the information that you write on your reverse proxy layer and provide the same experience to the developers. So in the hash of parameter, they still have a file handler that opens the file on disk. Please remember when you do something like this to sign all the information that you are changing because you don't want someone from the outside to inject uh, location on, your, on the disk of your machine. Just remember this. So we speed up the upload and bye-bye slow request. Finally, we can go back to our original problem. 
we had to ship cloud native charts and we had a problem with NFS. So raise your hand if you are familiar with NFS. Okay. Now keep your hands up if you are familiar with production requirement for a huge installation of NFS. <laughs> okay, <laughs> this, is, this is a normal answer. Okay, in our case, we have an eight core machine with 50 gigabytes of RAM. Two of them, because we are dealing with two separate sh set of uh, exports, so we have two shares, and it's a still a single point of failure. NFS is really huge in terms of memory. You don't want to never swap because you are dealing with disk access, and if you are swapping, you can imagine what happens. So, this was a, this, these are two big expensive machines, and we need them for running our system. The reason why we need them is that if we go back to our reference architecture, we can imagine that these blocks are process, if we like, but as soon as we want to scale these thi this things, these are VM boundaries. So you can imagine that you have a load balancer, which is a machine, then you have uh, a set of virtual machines that are handling the web traffic, the synchronous processor, and the Redis. And in order to deal with shared disk, we had to add an NFS server. So these are the machine boundaries. When you move to Kubernetes, these machine boundaries translate more or less to pods. But the problem is that you cannot provide a cloud-native installation with NFS because it has to be provided outside of it. And it's still a single point of failure, still expensive. So the idea is that we want to ship a Helm chart that out of the box gives you all the, inform all the components you need for running this without relying on uh, the existence of an external sh storage. So thinking about this, we decided that the idea, the solution was to move the object storage implementation directly in workers. Now, there's a problem here. I was referring to the Q processor before, because th the idea is that we had uh, an enterprise offering, which is a pi uh, paid offering, with, which had the object storage implementation. So we had the basic implementation, the file was coming uh, to, to from the proxy to the disk, and then you had a worker that was just moving stuff from the local disk to the final destination in the cloud. The first problem is that we had to backport this to the open source version, because you cannot release a cloud native installation if you don't have the object storage available also in the, in the open source version, and this was the first problem. The second one was that because we had to migrate from one cloud infrastructure to the next one, we really want to avoid this mixed state when you, s you tell uh, a client that the file is safely stored on, the, on your instance, but it's somewhere on an NFS disk not yet uploaded to the cloud. So this was a prerequisite for doing the migration, because we want to make sure that as soon as we tell you 2000, 200, OK, the file is safe on the object storage. So we started with the first simple thing, which was Git LFS. So Git LFS is an extension for Git, which, is, which has a client component and a server component. And basically what happened is that instead of storing the snapshot of your asset inside Git itself, you have a separate set of, set of APIs that you can use for uploading uh, files, and then you store a reference in Git so that the Git client can download the asset when you do the checkout. So it, you can imagine if you are working with graphical assets or big files of any kind, you don't want to clone everything, including all the version of your design mockups, or let's say maybe you are doing you have uh, audio files or this kind of stuff that takes space. So you just want to clone the things that you need. So the, we started with this because the API was really simple. We had a specific endpoint where you, we get uh, the length of the request. Some, some may have that information in the body is just a file. So let me spend just one slide on the I.O. package. There was this talk this morning by Martin, beautiful I.O. It was 
basically I will talk based on this slide because I really love it. But coming from a Ruby on Rails background, the first time I saw the I.O. package, I said, really? Is, is just this? I was suspecting a more high-level interaction, more feature. So the first time I said, hmm, I really don't like it. But just using it, I realized the power of composition, the things that you can stream things around, and how this looks like the pipe operator on, on Unix shell. So I literally fall in love with it. So this is the idea that we took for doing the object storage implementation. This is uh, it's not a complete version. It's just uh, the bare minimum that you need for explaining the concept. And it still fits in on one slide. Just had to squeeze it a bit. So let's go through it. The first thing, we can imagine that we have a package that deals with our upstream in terms of API. So we can ask the upstream server to pre-authorize uh, this, up, uh, this upload request. We want a pre-signed URL where we can store the git LFS object in our case. Then you can start a new request, but you are just going to use the request body, the incoming request, as the body of the outgoing request. So as soon as you read the content of the git LFS push, you're going to stream it directly to S3, Google Cloud Storage, or whatever your object storage implementation is. So you do this, and in the end, you're going to clone the body of the incoming request, remove the body, set the content length to zero, add some information where you explain where you wrote this, uh, the content, and go back, in, go through your middleware chain so you can imagine that it will be proxied to the to the upstream server. So this is uh, an example of the body hijacking technique that I was referring before with uh, direct uploading to object storage. Again, remember to sign the information that you... You can use JWT token on things like that. So, mission complete. Well, not exactly. So we had this technical depth, okay? So the problem was unknown length requests from 35,000 CI runner out there, so outside of our control. As I said, we had to migrate to Google Cloud Platform, and Google Cloud Platform has this compatibility layer with S3, so you can expect the basic API to be available on both, except for a tiny extension that is available only on Google Cloud Platform. You can stream an object without setting the length up front. This only works on Google Cloud Platform. So for our uh, use case, this was OK. We could migrate and keep this working. But because someone can, may be willing to replace with Mini.io or with um, S3 or other implementation, we had to take care of this problem. Because we could not just break the API for 25,000 runners. So we had to figure out how to deal with this. Looking through the API specs, we found the multi-part uploads, which is this idea of divide and upload. So you have an object, then you split this in two parts, and you upload each part with more or less the same API that you use for uploading a normal object. And then you have a final API for finalizing everything. So one file, more chunks, then you upload everything, finalize, you get one file back, the URL of the final. So this was the idea. We want to use this, but all the SDK that we found were really designed for a specific use case, which is speeding up the upload of a file that is already available on disk. So they were either using all the memory available on the system, or they, were, they required you to know the length up front. And we didn't know the length of the, of the CI artifacts. So we had to keep memory usage under control, but also disk storage under control. Because now that we removed the shared disk, we no longer have a place on disk where we can say, just dump the file. We removed the constraint of uh, a shared storage, so we had to handle concurrent uploads at the same time without using too much RAM and too much disk space. The idea is more or less what is in this flow. We create a temporary file. We write up to 50 megabytes. 
then we upload this as a single part in a multi-part upload, and we delete it. Then if we reach the end of the, of the incoming request, yeah, sorry, if it's not the end of the incoming request, we go back, create a new temp file, write, upload, delete. You go through this until you read all the incoming requests, and then you perform the, the finalized upload request, and all of these chunks became just one single file in the S3 or S3-like server. That you have. So we implemented this, and we managed to ship also the cloud native installation. And this is the journey that we started. There are still problems. Not all the S3-like implementation are equal. So we had still trouble with some vendor, but you got the idea. We were able to ship this and also to do the, the migration live. So I want to outline a couple of takeaway points, what we learned from this. So yes, you can speed up a web application writing a reverse proxy in Go, and it's an iterative approach. So you can keep delivering your product, your software, whatever it is, month by month without investing too much time into it. You should write only slow endpoints, otherwise you're just doing a full rewrite of your system, which is what, what you want to do. And this is, the, this is an enabler if you want to move to um, microservices architecture, because instead of rewriting the things in Go, you can just forward to another service, what we ended up doing for Git operation, for instance. And remember, always sign modified requests. If you touch something, sign it. So worker search code is available as a, is open source, is mid-licensed. This is the URL. Again, my Twitter handle, my email, if you want to reach out. I have stickers, so if you have questions, I'm, I'm here. Thank you for your time. Um, thanks for the talk. Um, in the beginning slide, you basically said that uh, um, you wanted to do something simple and you imported a uh, Gorilla Max. Why didn't you use the standard library? Was there some decision or just normal preference? Okay. This is not the code that we are using. Yeah, I remade all the example just for fitting them in one slide. So this is the only reason how, why I choose the, the Gorilla Max. I knew about it and one line I could just explain the concept. So that's it. You sure? You'll have a chance. So I guess it's coffee time. Yep, coffee time. Um, <laughs> perfect. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome.